Um, although I sometimes feel like a broker, uh, I don't think I will fit the definition of my colleagues over here. Uh, I'm working for uh, Sungard. Uh, Sungard is the largest privately held business solutions and software uh, company uh, in the world. Uh, we have uh, around 20,000 employees, 25,000 customers, and we service them in about 70 different countries. I'm working within the capital markets and investment banking unit of, uh, of Sungard, and we more or less provide solutions from connectivity to settlement. Great, thanks. So let's start. Let's let, let's start the acrimony really quickly, Asa. Um, you know, your regional broker. You know, why should we be working with you when we can just you know give the water flow to Matt, who said he's a really global player and he can execute everything. So, what what do you, what do you see your role is, and, and how do you see the, the role of the value of the local broker versus the big behemoth? Um, I think that a regional broker will need to. Uh, provide a full service to their domestic clients or what is defined as their domestic market and uh, you can no longer provide only a very small range of services partially because some of these clients won't fit into the client model of the very large brokers like uh, Credit Suisse or the other international brokers and they will simply not be eligible as clients for them but they will be for us because we provide them with a wide range, wide range of services. Um, I think also that, so to some extent, it's a full service to domestic clients and specialized services to global clients. And uh, that has to do with focusing on what you're really good at, and that is understanding your home market, the products that are uh, within your specialty, the markets that you're closest to, which it would include in our case would be Nordic markets. Um, in terms of uh, execution, we're talking about liquidity in the Nordic markets. We have the highest market share of, of uh, any broker in the combined Nordic markets and uh, will therefore be able to provide liquidity on a scale which is unprecedented even on the international brokers. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I think that also goes for when you move into the small and mid-cap space, for example, where uh, smaller or regional brokers will provide maybe a more intense service or have a much longer list of companies that they cover compared to, for example, the global brokers. Those are a few examples of what a regional or a domestic broker can provide even to global and very advanced clients. Now, Matt, um, you know, uh, how do you see this kind of shaping up? Do you see kind of a role for the regional player? And I know you work with some regional regional players. Or should yes, all the flow come to you? And, and yes, we do. Um, I think the short answer is whoever your broker is, wherever they're trading on your behalf, that broker needs to be adding value to the trading process. If that's through a specialized research product, so be it. If that's through providing liquidity that another broker can't provide, then so be it. But you've got to be seen to be adding value. One of the things that, um, that the MIFID process brought in was, was supposed to be about competition and actually kind of leveling the playing field. And actually what it did was, was played into the hands of the guys with the money. Because through competition of the marketplace, through fragmentation, et cetera, et cetera, it meant that the build and the spend that went on IT resources and technology just, just skyrocketed. So. You know, there was a function of scale there that the big guys had that the, some of the smaller guys didn't. Um, and in that respect, it didn't necessarily achieve what it, what it set out to do. Um, but I think, you know, what, what we see now is that, you know, volume isn't necessarily as, uh, <laughs> as fluid, if you like, as it was a couple of years ago. Um, and I certainly see a lot of clients that are looking to consolidate their broker lists. Again, that theoretically plays very much into the hands of the guys that can provide global access, can provide the full service suite. But I don't necessarily think it, 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 it needs to marginalize the regional brokers completely, but I do think that those regional brokers need to, to be able to prove that they add value to, to the brokerage uh, process. Yeah, Michael, how, how do you see kind of the, the regional firms adding value and, and uh, really differentiating themselves? Well, I, the brokers uh, uh, I have been talking to uh, try to, of course, try not to be too much alike. 
they try to differentiate themselves from, from the others. And I think uh, the ones I spoke try to find that in offering business intelligence. So being able to, uh, to really make use of the fact that they know the local market, they know the local players, they can oversee the full chain of what they offer to their clients. Um, so they are really keen on trying to offer this, this business intelligence. And there are also some who really try to keep their customers or their flow uh, loyal to them by, by making sure that they uh, offer these clients the highest value. Uh, I think one of the examples in the Netherlands is a relatively small bank who used to be a market maker firm, then changed itself into a uh, floor broker and then went on to become a retail broker. And in their mission statement they say, we want to offer our clients with the same tools as the professional investors. And we want to achieve the highest customer satisfaction by uh, giving them the, the lowest price possible. And they, they, they gained a lot of flow in the Netherlands, which is my home base. And I think they control at this moment 50% of the flow. And now they are looking, of course, at, at things to make sure that they keep the flow by partnering with some, uh, uh, some liquidity providers and making sure that they more or less internalize their flow. So basically, you know, create a critical mass and then leveraging it, basically. Yep. And, and keeping it there. If, if you have this critical mass of flow, it's, it's hard to break in on that, uh, yeah. on that critical mass. Bradley, you know, how do you see the, the, the regional firms kind of offering unique value? Um, well, you know, in the end, it's uh, it still is a, a people business, and uh, you know, it's being a, a local broker, a regional broker. You do have that uh, that understanding, the local culture, those relationships uh, to bring to the table. Um, you know, but in the end, the this thing that's going to be most important is you have to, you know, have a, 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 dif a differentiator and, and, and a. a, 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 a Value offering that that is perceived by the clients to be something that's you know that's 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 worth more than going with a global global player because you know at the end uh, and whether that's if it's market share or whether it's uh, uh, technology um, and you know might in the U.S. you know I started out as a as a U.S. only firm and uh, um, you know built up its 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 its, its market share and, and today uh, is is becoming a global player um, but. You know, there's definitely we still see ourselves in, in the U.S. as as a regional player, as one with with uh, uh, market knowledge, with with uh, uh, with value to to give to our clients because of the the not only the market knowledge but the the, the spend in technology and uh, investment in advancing uh, the the algorithmic product and, and smart order routing. Um, and you know, I was to, to Matthew's point earlier. I think uh, he's absolutely right. You know, with with Mifid in Europe. Um, the, it, it was brought in with the, the view of, of promoting competition, and I think the burden of, of, of Mifid for a lot of regional brokers has, has been too much. And, and, and you know, obviously, some have risen to the, to, to the challenge and have, have advanced and have really flourished in, in the new environment. But uh, you know, a lot of the smaller firms just don't have the deep pockets uh, to invest in, in, in smart order routing and, and all the required technology today. Um, and you know, and not just invest in smart order routing, but do it in a way that they can be beat out the the, 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 the the competitors on a global level. I'd like to dive a little deeper into this, you know, that issue, Matt, uh, and, and probably with Matt and also. Um, how do you create a partnership? So let's start with Matt. So here you are, a global firm, um, you know, great at infrastructure and technology, you can pretty much get anywhere. And here Asa is a very you know, definitive understanding and knowledge of the clients and the market structures. How do you work a, a, a smooth partnership so that you know um, SEB doesn't feel threatened and and you know um, and that you can really play a valuable role to her without disintermediating the client? Sure. Well, I mean, it's an interesting dynamic because naturally, you know, we can see ourselves as competitors, and there are ways that we can work together to kind of create a, a greater product for us both. Um, one point I mentioned earlier, and I think I'll come back to this, is liquidity for starters. Um, there are naturally some clients that, that we may not tap into, that, that, that ours, as, ours as a team will. Um, and in that respect, that there are, there's liquidity that SEB might have, for example, that we don't. Likewise, as I mentioned, Crossfinder is, as a crossing engine has become a 
a, a huge animal in itself, and we have significant liquidity in all the markets we trade in, in Western Europe, for example, there. Um, so there are certain arrangements there that I'm sure that we would like to further um, in terms of understanding each other's and, 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 and being able to take advantage of each other's liquidity. Um, I also think that, you know, again, coming back to the point about broker lists, there are a lot of clients these days that want a full suite of products available to them from all the brokers they have on their list. And that often includes algorithmic tools, for example. Now, not all of the regional brokers, again, have the, the, uh, the ability to invest in those products and build out the, uh, the algorithmic suites that they might want to be able to offer that, that the likes of Credit Suisse can. So in certain circumstances, there are ways that, that you, know, you can work together with a local player to create a product that, that works for both of them. Um, and I think we see more and more requests from regional brokers looking to leverage our technology, um, but allowing them to keep hold of their client base. So I think there's a, an important relationship there as well. Awesome. Is this kind of a service research kind of base, high touch kind of feel maneuvering that, that you feel comfortable um, with working with, with with a global player like that? I think that we would uh, we feel very comfortable in our relationships with those suppliers that we use that provide us with, uh, for example, technology. Uh, some will provide us with uh, with uh, the ability to. Uh, uh, let's say cross our flow uh, in a way that allows us to tier our flow and to preference our own flow, creating uh, like a pool within a pool uh, that will allow me to effectively offer my clients a dark pool without taking the regulatory risk of actually creating one, starting one up, having to deal with the transaction reporting and then find out two years down the line that this is actually not going to be allowed any further. The investment that I have to do is considerably, relatively larger for me than it is, for example, for uh, someone like uh, Credit Suisse. I think in terms of any partnership, uh, I think it's important to remember that in those circumstances, we would be a client, uh, the global broker would be a provider. Uh, they are interested in leveraging their technology investment that has become very, very expensive, in particular now as volumes are down, so it's important for them to, to retain flow or to, to attract flow. Uh, it also allows for very, very interesting uh, pricing schedules and uh, price models, which are, can be very beneficial for those who are large liquidity providers regionally. Uh, those are examples of where you can cooperate, where you can get a win-win you know, a, a situation out of a regional broker and a global broker. Um, I think that uh, competition when it comes to the very large international clients you're going to have to live with. Uh, you can't, I don't think, I think it's unrealistic to believe that you can create some kind of exclusivity uh, agreement even if you are cooperating with the global house in your home market. I think you need to be confident enough and your products need to be good enough for you to actually, for you to actually enter into those agreements otherwise you really don't have anything to compete with and hence you should justifiably be out competed by your your global competitor now, now matt and mike um you know, how, 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 do, how do you guys look at this as well because i guess you're you're kind of in the same same dance as you know michael you, you've got a series of, of software assets and brokerage services that that, that you kind of you know, you know offer to clients to kind of leverage scale of, of sunburn um, now, how do you see this balance playing out between you know, the larger players and the more regional folks? Well, uh, personally, I do not really believe in partnership of, of partners with the same business model. It, it, to me, it sounds a little bit like calling a takeover a merger. Uh, there's always one dominating the other over time. Uh, so, well, again, I think uh, you, should, you should use your own strength and you, you have alternatives for, for tapping into other liquidity. And then, yeah, then I can mention that SunGuard, we, we could call it carrier neutral, is, is not, not into this broker business, but still can offer uh, solutions to tap into to broader liquidity at other markets. Uh, Bradley, um, you know, you, uh, in some ways you're a regional firm, in some ways you're a lot bigger than a regional firm. How do you kind of balance some of these partnerships out? 
Well, yeah, I mean, um, the, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a ba- it is, as you say, a balance. You know, there, there is uh, relationships change over time. We, there, there may be uh, relationships that you enter into with regional uh, brokers that morph over time as the various companies change and as their strategies change. And uh, everyone has to go into these kinds of relationships with their, with their eyes uh, wide open and with a clearly set uh, objectives and uh, um, you know, rules of engagement. Um, and uh, and uh, you know we've had we've enjoyed some long and, and very profitable mutually profitable relationships with the regional brokers in areas where we where we were weak, um, and, uh, and and you know we feel that yeah exactly mutually uh, beneficial and um, uh, you know Knight, Knight has transitioned over the last few years into a, a global broker. We have offices across uh, Asia, across Europe, um, uh, and, and of course in the in the U.S. Uh, and the Americas, um, and. Uh, but you know there, there is value, and there is there are uh, there, there is value from regional brokers for a, a firm like Knights, and, and in return, the, the regional brokers see value in, in, in technology that that Knight has, or the the access that Knight uh, can give uh, in markets where Knight is strong, stronger. Okay, um, we've got only about five or seven minutes left, and I think one of the, the, the big things that I uh, start this with, with Asa is is you know we're you know, we're seeing new MIFID proposals, and certainly, um, you know, regulation is a huge specter on the horizon. I'm not necessarily sure how it's all going to play out. Um, how do you balance this whole regional versus global issue around regulation? And, and you know, um, will you lean on partners to try to help you? And how, how will that whole, how will that all play out? Or, or do you think you'll kind of take all that on yourself? And um, how, how do you think? You know, this whole regulatory infrastructure will, will, will play out of that And I think that you have to um, you have to uh, evaluate the cost versus the benefit, like you do with many other things. But I think the regulatory cost burden is another investment which needs to be weighed up carefully when you consider whether you do things yourself or whether you outsource. And what are your core products? What are your core markets? Where will you actually add value? relative to your clients and I think in local markets where we have significant strength where we are very familiar with the local authorities for example we will undoubtedly be able to add significant value also in the regulatory space because even European regulation is being interpreted locally Uh, similarly uh, to give an example we have just opened an office in Hong Kong we'll start trading equities uh, in the Asian market on behalf of our uh, domestic clients primarily and for some hedging purposes. Still, we are not at this stage starting an office and becoming you know, direct members in all of these exchanges on day one. That does not make sense for us. We will use third party brokers in this particular context, but we're also not uh, expecting to deal Asian equities for Asian clients at this particular moment in time. So I think it's, it's, the regulatory burden is significant and it will become a barrier of entry for many smaller brokers. And you have to have a certain size uh, in any, even as a regional broker, you have to have a certain size to be able to, to, to carry that burden. But at the same time, it is no different than any other investment you make, as in technology or uh, local uh, brokerage knowledge or market knowledge in order to, to start a business. You make those evaluations in terms of whether it makes sense to do it yourself or whether you use someone else. Matt, how do you kind of see this, you know, method playing out in the implementation and where this balance between local and, and, you know, global will play out? Well, I mean, how long we got? Um, <laughs> anytime you mention MIFID, we could sit here for hours and hours and debate what, what's going to happen when actually we don't yet know. So, for starters, there are a lot of unknowns at the moment, which mean that it's very difficult for any broker to build a strategy around something that may or may not happen. So, everybody's in the same scenario in that respect right now. Um, I do think, just to pick up on, on one point that also made there, was that you know that there are different interpretations of regulation within local marketplaces. One of the things that MIFID II is obviously bringing in, and the changes that are going going through at a European level right now, is the concept of ESMA being one central regulator. So there is every chance, if if they follow through what they've said that they're going to do, that the regulatory landscape becomes far more even. Right now, you know. <laughs> If you look at Spain as an example, you know the rules that apply to most European countries simply have not been uh, introduced to the Spanish market in the same way. 
it's a completely different model right now. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see what, 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 what happens with a one central regulator. Um, I do think as a, as a general uh, rule though that with what I've seen coming through from MIFID II and the EMIR directive and the markets abuse directive, there's going to be more and more emphasis placed on any broker to police the flow that they have, to invest in the technology to ensure that they're, they're doing the things that they say they do, to complying with their best execution policies, to going to the necessary venues they want to. And again, you know, within the OTC derivatives markets, we're seeing more and more emphasis on that market being ultimately moved to, to an, an electronic change, traded model. Um, and that, again, is going to require technological spend. So I do think that there is going to need, there's going to be a need for more continued investment from, from all brokers. And you know, I, I think that some will struggle with that, especially within the flows that we're seeing right now. Um, and I think people are going to have to understand that investment is going to be a necessary part of, of what we all do in the future. So, you know, Bradley mentioned big pockets and, and you know, it's, it's a reality right now. Um, and again, that perhaps comes back to the local versus regional dynamic where, you know, perhaps the local guys need to leverage of what the, the, the big guys are already doing. Um, that may not create a more competitive environment in some respects, but um, it, it may keep some regional firms in business in another. Yeah, I just wanted to say that, you know, to point out that all the, the large, the largest houses uh, in our industry all started out as regional brokers themselves, um, you know, in, in, whether it's in Switzerland or the US or the UK and, uh, you know, and, and through their skill and their ingenuity and drive and, you know, perseverance, they, they've created these, these fantastic global companies. Um, and, I, you know, it would just be, uh, I would like to see that continuing, that, uh, you know, so regional brokers you know, like SEB or, or any other could, could you know, con there, there aren't too many obstacles in, in their, you know, quest to, to actually to, to, uh, um, to, to drive and expand and, and, and forge, forge forward. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, already, it's already such a Darwinian and difficult uh, trading environment out there without the regulator actually making it extremely difficult and actually hold, holding back. I don't think anybody wants to see regional players all, you know, disappear as a breed. Um, and, uh, you know, there's definitely a bit of actually partnering with the, with the global player to, to get, to get the, the things that you don't have. But there's also, I think the regulator has to have the, take some responsibility for not crushing out the, the, the regional player from, uh, from, from the game at this stage. Sounds good. Yeah. Michael, you, you want to have a last word and we'll open up to maybe one question and then uh, uh, we'll, we'll apologize for all the noise and the, the difficulty in hearing everything. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, like, like the, the people before me said, the bar is raised and, and uh, in MIFID, the sequel, uh, there is, there is a, a better economic situation. There's much more fragmentation. Technology changed considerably. So yes, it will be, it will be quite a challenge. Uh, but I, of course, coming from that angle, but I think the solution will also come out of, uh, out of technology. I, I think we have time for maybe one question. Um, any questions? Yes, no? Well, with that, I think uh, I want to apologize for all the, the noise in here and, and want to thank everybody for sitting in. I want to thank uh, our great panel, Bradley Duke from Knight, Asa Palm from SEB, Matt Cousins from Credit Suisse, and Michael Sitz from SunGuard. And I'll bring it back to, to Mike Powell.